Well, let's return to the commodities conversation, but in the context of a private investor who has stakes in many explorers out there, what is he watching out for in this burgeoning potential super cycle? Let's ask Julian Bubbsey of uh, Jigsaw Invest that question live here in our studio. Julian, welcome back to the program. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Uh, look, uh, there is lots of uh, optimism, lots of money running around in the commodity space at the moment. Uh, how can you go and, uh, and find the winners from the losers in such an environment? Oh, look, I think we are at a pretty special time in the commodity cycle at the moment. Um, I think what we're seeing uh, with um, uh, stimulus all around the world in a very synchronised fashion is that where the central banks are trying to drive inflation. So we've seen a lot of commodity prices run quite aggressively, iron ore, copper, etc. And so it does feel like we are at the start of, of, of quite a, um, an interesting period for um, investing. So. I think typically what I like to do is um, obviously look from a top-down perspective. It's the easiest to invest in sectors when um, you've got strong um, commodity price response, which we're seeing, and then you've got to drill down from the top and look for often uh, some unfound uh, winners of the future. So that's what I've been doing over the last um, couple of years is sort of laying my bets in areas where I think the, uh, the commodity cycle could run for longer than, normal, than just the normal super cycle. Okay, so we talk a lot <laughs> about copper and gold, you know, all the usual sort of commodities. Done a bit of research and I understand that you have uh, an interest in a sand development, sand development, just to emphasize in WA. I've done a bit of reading about sand. Fascinating, but it appears as if we're on the cusp of some sort of global shortage, correct? Well, yes, we are. And look, it's, it's quite, um, it's almost comical to, to say that sand is in short supply because every, everywhere you go, you can see it on the beaches and, and through deserts, but it's quite a nuanced market. So the, um, the sand industry is really underpinned by, um, by uh, cement and, and construction, where um, a vast amount of sand is used globally. And that's typically been sourced from places like river systems, particularly for the Asian region through Southeast Asia, through places like Vietnam, um, uh, the Philippines, etc. So previously, places like China, um, Japan and Korea were sending barges up rivers to essentially hoover up the, yeah. the bottom of the rivers. And that was causing huge environmental devastation. So what a lot of these countries have, have started doing is limiting their supply because they've realised they're selling something in a very short term perspective and having very long term environmental consequences. So that's created a bit of a short, shortening in their supply response. And at the same time, the demand for sand is actually growing consistently through urbanisation and also specific uses like uh, solar power. Panel, um, which surprisingly uses very high quality sand. And so what we've found is that uh, buyers or traditional buyers, particularly from China, are having to look much further afield down to places like Australia, where they want to be buying their uh, sand from very, um, I guess, more, uh, more mining friendly jurisdictions mm -hmm. that can do it in a way that's more repeatable and, and sustainable. And so we're, uh, as a result, we're seeing the, the, the price of sand go up considerably. So concrete sand, for example, has gone up from about $10 a tonne to almost $50 a tonne over the past 10 years. And we've seen sand that goes into things like uh, clear glass, etc., go up from probably $20 to more than $70 a tonne. So there's a real commodity boom going on in the sand market. And so are there listed Australian companies that mine sand, for lack of a better term? Yeah, look, there's no one doing it um, yet from a mining perspective. There's a couple of privately owned um, mines that are exporting into the Asian region. But in a listed perspective, there's Perpetual Resources, which I'm the executive chairman of. Another company is called VRX. Um, there's Diatreme Resources, Metallica Minerals, and a range of other small ones. So really what we're all doing is drilling out our deposits now um, and getting ready for, for the, the boom that we think is going to come in the demand side. Yeah, I think that's a fascinating uh, fascinating story. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, look, uh, talking of fascinating stories, battery. Uh, you cannot get a guest in this program who seems to go and talk down the battery uh, thematic at the moment. Seems to be everywhere. Are you a believer in the technology? And if so, where are you looking? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to give you a different point of view. I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. very much uh, a bull on the, the battery thematic and have been, to be honest, for the last probably 10 years. And there's been a couple of cycles in there, but I definitely think this cycle is the one uh, that's, that's probably got more longevity than most. So I'm a non-executive director of a company called Iron Ear Limited, who, which is an ASX listed company that's developing a project in Nevada. So we think we've got uh, the next best development project in America. And interestingly, we think that's a, a great place to be developing a, a lithium mine because there's only 5,000 tonnes of lithium produced domestically in America. And our mine, we think, can do 20,000 tonnes a year once it's in production. And we think the demand out of America for... Um, for the sources or, or for the uses in things like the, the Tesla um, uh, developments, we'll, we'll use many, many multiples of that. So we think it's a great time to be developing a lithium mine in, in, um, in a first world jurisdiction and a place that really needs the, the capacity. Because it's not just Tesla, it's Ford, it's GM, it's uh, you know, Toyota, mm. it's everybody who's operating in North America. But you talk about production. I mean, it takes a long time to get pr to production. So how, how, far, are, how far is Ioneer on that, that journey? 
You know, I first invested in Iron Ear about four years ago when they just found the deposit. So here we are four years later, we've com completed feasibility studies, definitive feasibility studies, and we're in the process of funding that project right now. So the reality is if we get funded by the end of this year, which we think we will, we won't be in production until the end of 22 or early 23. So it's still a couple of years to go, but again, that demonstrates how long that uh, development cycle yeah. can be and why there's not a huge supply response that can overwhelm that demand. Uh, just a question with our notice, uranium. Do you have any interest in uranium? I don't do a lot in uranium, unfortunately, so no, I'm not probably yeah. the most intelligent uh, uh, viewpoint on that. No, I just was wondering what the next big thing is. Maybe we'll have to talk about it next time. Thank oh. you so much for today. Again, appreciate it.